morning, everyone. Good morning. The response is Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Praise be to God. Welcome, everyone, to our Easter service. I'd like to thank the deacons for getting up at a godly hour, somewhere around 3 a.m. this morning, to prepare everything for our, our sunrise service. And there is a multitude of food that's left over, so please, at the end of our service, Come down and partake of it, or I'll be taking it home and I'll be back on Nutra System or something like that. Are there any concerns for prayer which we would like to lift up before the congregation? Mark? Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to have a prayer for, uh, for Kathy and her family, please. For Kathy and her family, very good. Continue prayers for my son, Eric. Prayers for my good friend Ben Yell, he has cancer. Jason. Uh, good prayers because I go in for another treatment uh, on Tuesday. Good. Side effects get worse as the treatments keep going. So. I know, I know. Hang in there. Jerry. Yeah, for uh, well, I'm bad at it myself. Uh, we had a terrible winter down in Florida this winter. Between her falling down and my hip popping out, we, uh, we survived the uh, coming back. You know, so. so between the two of you, we got one complete person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're tough on her. <laughs> Good to have you back. Thank you. Fee. I pray for uh, Beatrice's family, please. Um, they just lost her cousin, Esther, um, just earlier this morning. Sisters come home, see their parents and kids. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, he has become my salvation. Hark, glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does value me. The right hand of the Lord is, ex of, is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does value me. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through. I thank thee that thou hast answered me, and hast become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us rejoice today, dear Lord, for the great gift of eternal life you have given us through your Son. We have come here, our battered and broken people, seeking redemption, and you, out of unconditional love, have come to us as a man, suffered with us, suffered for us, died for our sins, and resurrected, announcing the death of death. We praise and thank you, dear Lord, for this great gift, as we offer this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please join with me in our unison prayer of invocation on the inside of your book. We offer you our praise, O Lord, most blessed, for you are gracious, merciful, and righteous. 
the rising of the sun who had said it, your name is to be exalted above every other name. You raise the poor from the dust and lift up the needy from the ashes. You care for the widow and give the orphan a home. You bring relief to the sick, the mourning, and the marginalized. Yet especially on this day, we raise our voices in thanks that you have fulfilled your promise in sending your Son to take upon our frail nature, who by his holy and spotless life fulfilled for us all obedience, and by the sacrifice of his death robbed the grave of victory, and after having given himself as a ransom for the whole world, by his resurrection restored the world to life. Let this great gift transform us that we might walk before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days. This we pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Please remain seated as we have our hymn of adoration, Thine is the Glory, hymn number 291. Into who you know we can be. 
Risen Lord Jesus, give ear to this prayer, offered in your name. Amen. Hear now the assurances of God's love and God's forgiveness, as recorded in the Gospel of John, where it is written, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Holy and gracious God, we take these words to heart and you seek to save all of us. Like the shepherd who went searching for one sheep that was lost, you come to us, you bring us home, you bring us to safety. And in the end of our lives, at that time and that place, you will bring us into your heavenly kingdom which has no end. This has been bought for us by the life, the death, and the resurrection of your Son, in whose name we glorify this day. May these prayers be found acceptable in his holy name. Amen. Will you please stand and join with me in our glory of God. He's on our 
life and conqueror of death, we bring before you these gifts. They are but our tithes and our offerings, symbols of our life and of our labor. And we ask that you take them and use them, and take us and use us for the spreading of your gospel and the work of your church, both here and throughout the world. This we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And as you remain seated, would you join with me in our call to prayer? Gracious God, we have come here to celebrate the death of death, the gift of eternal life, and the presence of Christ in our midst. We raise our voices for those who are in need. We pray for Beverly, the two Beverly's that are suffering from cancer, from Eric who suffers from cancer. We pray prayers for Kate, for Kathy. We pray prayers for those in our church that you know need your healing touch. The family of Beatrice is passing the one of her own. For Anita, there's a healing. We pray for Jason as he's going forward for another treatment this week. May you be with him as I know you will be. We pray for Jerry and Maddie, there's a healing after a very hard time in Florida and returning to us. Pray for the hungry and the homeless, for the beauty of this church, for the ability to come here and worship freely when in other countries they cannot. And we pray for ourselves, asking what you would want us to do for you. We are always asking what we, you can do for us. Guide us, dear Lord, with the presence and power of your Holy Spirit, 
Give us the ears to hear, and we will do your will. Here are these prayers for those mentioned in Mount Zion, for those who remember in Mount Zion, as well as the prayer that Jesus taught the faithful when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Second hymn is I know that my Redeemer lives in number two hundred and ninety five. Chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. 
They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord, and their children with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy, and all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Our second reading comes from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43, and if you'd like to follow along, that is on page 957. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How we went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses to all that he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him manifest, not to all the people, but to us, who were chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, and that is located on page 944, if you want to follow along. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And, stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying, and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know that the scripture, the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you see? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you would carry him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless these readings and bless our understanding of them. Always to his glory. Amen. Let us be in the spirit of prayer at this time. On this day, Lord Jesus, we sing songs of praise because this is the day you defeated death and sin, 
and most trained. You showed us the power in saving, suffering love that, over, that overcomes. When we come to some trauma in our lives, and there appears to be no way out, grant unto us, even us, the faith whereby we remember your triumphant resurrection, and thereby take heart. When, we hope, when our hope wavers and we are so consumed by the moment that we cannot see a way out, an option to relieve our distress, or a path to our problems, come to us, Lord Jesus, in all your saving power. When we come face to face with our own deaths, or the deaths of those whom we love, help us to remember Easter and your victory over sin and death. Grant us the assurance to know that as you triumph over death, you promised to bring us along with you, so that in life and in death we might live in hope. Hope not in ourselves or our own efforts, but hope in you. Heavenly Father, who has made us that we live not by bread alone, but by every word of God, and who has taught us not to spend our labor on that which cannot satisfy. Be pleased, we ask you, to remove from us all distraction of mind, every burden of soul, and any disturbance of spirit that cleanse and purify that we may hunger after the heavenly food contained in this message and find it in our daily provision on the way to eternal life. Bless this sermon and all that is true to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The story of our rebellion is one whose roots sink deep so deep that they are in truth part of who we are. Recall again the story of the fall. Adam and Eve, a man and a woman representing all of humanity, lived in harmony with God. Yet within this garden, this place of perfection where humanity walked intimately with God as a friend, the Almighty bestowed upon us the gift of free will that allowed us to individually nourish and nurture our talents and creativity in ways that benefited us as well as glorified and reverenced our God. In God's love for us and in his desire to have us find fulfillment by living up to our potential, God allowed us free reign within paradise with only one stipulation. Namely, we were to place God first in our lives loving him above all else, and not become gods in our own right. So important was this to the Almighty that he warned any violation of this one central tenet would incur the penalty of death. Yet the draw to rebellion proved too strong, and we willfully, purposefully, did exactly the opposite of what God had commanded. The consequence of this action and the sentence under which all humanity then and now stands condemned, is the product of our own doing, and we have no one to blame but ourselves. It is not God's fault, it is our fault. It is not through God's action, it is through our action. This is what God had declared, and what God cautioned would be the result of such a flagrant violation of his will. Yet death was not to be instantaneous, but incremental, taking place over time, common to all yet individual to each. Some would roam this earthly plane until hair turns gray and bodies sag under the weight of age. Others would shed the troubles of the day and the strife and suffering of the world while still in the prime of life, when eyes were bright and bodies strong. The angel of death would now, each day, leave the highest of heavens, sent by the Almighty himself to collect the souls of those for whom time has simply run. None were exempt, king and commoner, the rich and the poor, the sinner and the saint, all for whom the sands of time had run complete, faced the same fate and paid the same price. As if this weren't enough, we could not die within the confines of paradise, where death does not exist, but were destined to die outside of its gates where God hosted cherubim with a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Still, even in our rebellion, God cared for us. Before Adam and Eve left the garden, the Lord God made skins 
from, made garments of skins and clothed them. In short, God sacrificed an animal within the confines of the garden to cover the man and his wife. Put another way, just as a perfect blood sacrifice ushered us out of the garden, a perfect blood sacrifice was required to allow us back into the garden. Yet it was not something we could provide. Just as God had initiated the action which witnessed us leaving the garden, God would initiate the action that would foster our return. This perfect blood sacrifice would come in the person of Jesus, where God would sacrifice to himself, which would be the only acceptable sacrifice. For what could we give God that God does not already possess? God's love is so pure, and his desire for us to return to him so profound, that he became what he created, clothed himself in the skin of a man and walked among us. I have often said, when God is present, all things change, it could not be otherwise. This is why when Jesus is present, he cures the ills of the world, restoring sight to the blind, making the lame to walk, cleansing lepers, making the deaf to hear, raising the dead, as well as performing exorcisms and miracles. Through him, the compassion and love of God can be witnessed. It is a love that is all-encompassing, one that extends to the Jew and the Gentile, the Samaritan and the Israelite, the enemy and the friend, Notice at no time does Jesus turn anyone away. No matter how tired he is, no matter how hungry, how busy, how stressed he is for time, Jesus always takes the people and meets them where they are, restoring them to wholeness and, at least in the case of the young rich man, made the offer to have him follow. While all these are important indicators of Jesus' divinity, his real mission is to be that, to be that perfect sacrifice, that perfect blood sacrifice, which opens the gates of heaven and allows us to re-enter and resume the relationship we had with God from the very beginning. The proof of this comes in our account of the resurrection recorded in the Gospel reading today. It is Sunday, and Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. Despite the early hour, she notices that the stone which covered the front of the tomb has been taken away. Suspecting grave robbers, she runs and tells Simon Peter and the beloved disciple. What, caught, what ensues is a foot race. The beloved disciple, whose name is never mentioned, but whose scholars believe to be John, is presumably a younger man, and outruns Peter, arriving at the tomb first. He stoops, looks in, and witnesses the linen clothes lying there, but he does not go in. Peter arrives shortly afterward in true form, shows no hesitation, and went into the tomb. He likewise notices the linen clothes which had covered Jesus' body lying there. In addition, he notices the napkin which had covered Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. It is an important detail which lends support to the belief that this was not a grave robbery, but a resurrection that Jesus had been predicting. I say this because why would grave robbers take the time to neatly roll up the head cloth and to place it in a spot all by itself? My belief is that this is a sign from Jesus to his disciples, proclaiming that his resurrection from the dead has actually occurred. At this point, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and it says he believed. But what exactly did he believe? We would be wrong to conclude that the beloved disciple saw that this is a sign of Jesus' resurrection. For in the next two verses we are told, For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. The disciples went back to their homes. In short, the beloved disciples, disciple believes that Mary is correct. Someone has stolen the body of Jesus. Otherwise, why would they go home unchanged, unmoved, and unfazed? Mary, for her part, stands, stays at the tomb, weeping, alone. The English translation of the Greek word fails to capture the extent of her pain and her anguish. For she is not simply weeping. She is sobbing hysterically. Her grief so profound that she is almost out of control, as subsequent, subsequent events will testify. For it is at this point that she stooped 
and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Yet Mary's grief is so deep, so pronounced, she ignores the presence of the angels and thereby fails to take notice that the tomb is not a place of death at all, but a place of life. For contained within this empty room is not the sorrow of the grave, but God's victory over death. The tomb could not hold Jesus. The cold grip of death could not restrain him. Mary, blinded by her sorrow, ignores all this. And when the angels ask her why she is still weeping, she persists in her belief that Jesus' body has been stolen, answering, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Despite the passage of almost 2,000 years, we can still hear, echoed in her voice, the raw, almost unbearable pain of loss. It is something we've all experienced, the death of a loved one so dear, so close, that we don't know if we will ever make it through. The days that have lost their meaning drag on with no end in sight. We seek relief, but can find none. This is Mary as she backs out of the tomb, turns around and comes face to face with a human figure who she mistakes to be the gardener. Again, her grief is so intense, so encompassing, that she fails to recognize that it is Jesus, the Holy One, in her midst. Initially, she asked the same, he asked the same question as the angels. Woman, why are you weeping? Before adding, whom do you seek? Thinking him to be the culprit, she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Her response is touching in its sincerity, in its honesty, and reflects the deep and abiding love she had for Jesus, and how all she wanted to do was to give his body, his mortal remains, a proper and respectful burial. It is only after he addresses her by name that realizing who he is, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabone, which means teacher. We can only imagine the joy and happiness she felt, not only at being reunited with Jesus, but that he was yet alive and that the power of the grave held no sway over him. This is the message of Easter. The good news that death is not the end, but a new beginning. It is not the finale, but a time of transition. This is our hope and our assurance of things to come. That's why we have gathered here today to give thanks to our God, who despite our rebellion and the many times and ways we have fallen short, loves us with such a pure and unconditional love that he has sacrificed the part of himself that we might live with him in eternity. Still, there are the naysayers, those distractors, that will question the truth of the resurrection. In the scientific age in which we live, such individuals as these demand hard and fast proof. But proof in the sense they require will not be forthcoming. This was a divine event. The reason that why there are no earthly representatives is that the occasion is too holy for mere mortals to observe. Think again of when Moses asked to see God's glory, and the Almighty responds, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me. <laughs> or when the Roman guards, while watching Jesus tomb, over Jesus' tomb, encounter the angel of the Lord, and are so afraid they tremble that became like dead men. Otherwise, standing in front of them, in front of that which came from heaven, the Roman guards overcome by that which is so holy, simply faint. The Apostle Paul addresses the importance of the resurrection in his first letter to the Corinthians. Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. 
We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Having explained what it would be like if the resurrection did not take place, Paul declares, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, as a guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the rising from death comes by means of a man. Just as we will die because of Adam, we will be raised to life because of Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. This is his pronouncement. This is his truth. And for this, let the people answer and say, Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 298, Christ Arose.
Leave here with the promise of Christ in your hearts and in your minds. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believe in me, though he die, it shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Go in the peace of Christ.